Hello everybody, welcome back to Cardinal Science for part two of the covalent bonding topic. So for point 1.47, we want to know why simple molecular structures are solids, liquids and gases with low melting and boiling temperatures. Now, to start with, we want to know that all covalent substances, barring a few exceptions, form simple molecular structures, and I'll explain what that is below. A simple molecular structure consists of molecules that contain covalently bonded atoms, but that those molecules are attracted to each other by what we call a weak intermolecular force. Intermolecular means between molecules, just like international means between nations. Now in this diagram, I've got some oxygen gas, and you can see I've got covalent bonds between oxygen atoms forming the O2 molecules. Now, there are, like I said, weak intermolecular forces between these molecules. So for example, and I represent these with a dashed line, we have weak intermolecular forces between the molecules like this. Now they can be attracted to any and all of them, not necessarily in the pattern that I'm drawing. But the point is here, that when we melt or boil a simple molecular structure, we do not break covalent bonds. What we do is we overcome weak intermolecular forces. And this means that they're quite easy to break because they're weak. And this therefore leads to low melting and boiling points. So just to reiterate, because it's very, very important, simple molecular structures have low melting and boiling points because the weak intermolecular forces, the forces between molecules, are easily overcome and only take a little bit of energy to break them. It is very, very important that we understand that we are not breaking covalent bonds when we melt or boil simple molecular structures. Now just see my diagram here. We've got two oxygen molecules next to each other, and you can see that they have weak intermolecular forces between them and the strong covalent bonds between the atoms. And when we heat them, what we're doing is pulling those molecules apart and extending the gap between them and therefore overcoming that weak intermolecular force. You can see that over here on this side, nothing has changed with regard to the molecules themselves, they're only further apart. Okay, so we've basically taken a liquid, we've overcome the weak intermolecular forces, and now we have a gas. Note, we still have weak intermolecular forces there, but we've just overcome them to pull the molecules further apart from each other. Now, what about the trends in melting and boiling point? So for 1.48, we need to understand that as the relative molecular mass of a simple molecular structure increases, so does its melting point or boiling point. Now this is because the larger a molecule is, the stronger the weak intermolecular forces are. So the more energy it takes to overcome them. Now this is actually because they have more electrons and you'll get into this more when you do A levels. Therefore, something like um, hydrogen, H2, is going to have a very low melting and boiling point because it only has one electron in each outer shell, as opposed to something like um, bromine, which is another diatomic molecule, which will have a much higher melting and boiling point because of course it has many, many more electrons. At your level, it's acceptable to just refer to the relative molecular mass. However, I wanted to be sure to explain that it is actually because of the number of electrons and not because of the mass directly, only that those molecules with larger relative molecular mass also have more electrons. So I said already that most covalent substances form simple molecular structures. And there are some very key exceptions that we need to know about. What these form is called a giant covalent structure instead of the simple molecular structure that we're already aware of. Now these structures are solids at room temperature and they have high melting and boiling points. An example of one of these is diamond. A diamond consists of carbon atoms bonded covalently to four other carbon atoms in what we call a tetrahedral structure. And each of those carbon atoms is bonded to four other carbon atoms. And what this leads to is the formation of a very large molecule, so large indeed that you can see it with the naked eye. So a molecule of diamond could be, for example, on a diamond ring. So when you see a diamond on a ring, what you're actually looking at is a single molecule of diamond. There are no weak intermolecular forces here, so if you try to melt diamond, what you're actually needing to do is to break all of these covalent bonds. We'll go into more detail in subsequent slides. 
Unlike with simple molecular structures, where melting and boiling requires you to overcome the weak intermolecular forces only and not break the strong covalent bonds, when you melt or boil giant covalent structures, you do indeed have to actually break those bonds. Now these bonds are very strong and there are very many of them, and so it requires a lot of energy to break them. Therefore, they have high melting and boiling points. So for example, diamond has a melting point of approximately 4000 degrees C. Okay, so there are two other properties of diamond that we need to be able to explain. It's hardness and it's conductivity. It's hardness comes about because of exactly the same reason that it has a high melting and boiling point. It's made of very many strong covalent bonds. To break them would require a lot of energy and therefore it's very, very hard. Now, with regard to its electrical conductivity, we're gonna apply my electrical conductivity checklist. Remember, for electricity to flow, you need electrons to be able to move or ions to be able to move. And to move, they need to be free. So we look at our structure of diamond and ask ourselves two questions. Are there any free electrons? No, there aren't. The electrons are in bonds and they are fixed around atoms. Are there any free ions? No, there are no ions here at all. Therefore, it does not conduct electricity. So another of these really key exceptions is graphite. It's also made of carbon, but it is made of rings of carbon atoms bonded in layers that have free electrons between them and some weak intermolecular forces between the layers. So because it's a giant covalent structure, it has a high melting and boiling point. However, its hardness is affected negatively because it only has weak intermolecular forces between those layers. So these red lines I've drawn here represent weak intermolecular forces. And you can see there are some delocalized electrons within that layer. Because those layers can move past each other, it makes it soft and slippery. And therefore graphite is actually used as a lubricant. So we now know that graphite is soft and why it's soft. And now let's look at its conductivity. So again, we ask ourselves the same two questions. Are there any free electrons that can move? Yes, there are. Are there any free ions? No. And one thing to note with regard to graphite is that the electrons are free to move, but only in this direction or in this plane. So it only conducts in one direction, but it does indeed conduct electricity. C60 fullerene is an exception among exceptions. So C60 fullerene is a ball of 60 carbon atoms covalently bonded together. And if you were to look at the structure, I recommend you look up one online. It looks like the structure of a football with hexagons tessellating to form a ball shape. Now, it is indeed a giant covalent structure. However, it actually has a low melting and boiling point because there are indeed weak intermolecular forces between each of those C60 football looking molecules. And so when you try to melt it and boil it, you're not breaking the covalent bonds in the ball structure, you're overcoming the weak intermolecular forces between the molecules. Now this also makes it soft, those weak intermolecular forces. And because it's soft, it can be used as a lubricant. Now, it also has delocalized electrons that are free to move around the structure of the ball. So if we ask ourselves our two questions with regard to electrical conductivity, does it have free electrons? Yes, it does. Does it have free ions? No, it conducts electricity. Now, the uses of C60 fullerene have come up in exams in the past quite commonly. And one of them I noticed that was quite strange at the time is its use as a drug delivery system because the ball itself is actually hollow. And so what you can do is you can put medicines inside the C60 fullerene ball, and that makes it good for delivering medicines. So there are a few ways this is examined, and it's very, very common that this topic comes up in exams. You could be asked to describe the bonding in, say, diamond, and explain why it has a high melting point. You'd go on to say, of course, that it's a giant covalent structure with many covalent bonds that are strong, and require a lot of energy to break, Therefore, they have high melting and boiling points. Number two, you might be asked to explain why, say, uh, carbon dioxide has a low melting and boiling point, while diamond and graphite have a high melting and boiling point. So you, you would explain each one separately, explaining why carbon dioxide, being a simple molecular structure, has a low melting and boiling point because you only have to overcome weak intermolecular forces, and why diamond and graphite have high melting and boiling points for the same reasons as I previously explained. You may be asked to explain why graphite conducts electricity while carbon dioxide doesn't, 
and you'll need to talk about the lack of free electrons that can move and carry charge or the lack of any ions that can do the same thing. These are often tied into large six mark questions spanning the whole bonding topic, comparing perhaps metallic bonding with a simple molecular structure or ionic with a simple molecular or a giant covalent with a simple molecular structure. Once again, thank you for watching Cardinal Science. I hope this has been helpful for you. Please leave a like and subscribe if it has, or leave a comment below if you have any questions or anything you'd like clarified. Keep an eye out for more videos coming soon in both chemistry and biology.